Hi, my name is Ayana. I am a DBSA peer. Um, I've been doing this for two and a half years now, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yes, I'm uh, a professor of psychiatry at Rush University in Chicago. I also have a private practice where I see a lot of patients with treatment resistant depression and have been using GNS therapy for almost 20 years, um, many of the trials included. Gary Sachs, I'm uh, 40 years into being a postgraduate medical student, still learning how to, how to do this, uh, I hope, better every year. Long way to go. Uh, but I have had a long uh, affiliation with Mass General and Harvard, where I'm um, associate clinical professor of psychiatry. And I have a full-time job at Signet Health, as well as a private consulting practice. Yeah, I mean, this ought to be the, the routine way for uh, clinicians and patients, peers to, to interact. Uh, sometimes it is and, and sometimes it isn't, but it starts with uh, being able to participate uh, together. And that means we start with agreeing to agree about what we're trying to do together. And right, that could be trying to improve depression. It could be trying to smooth out whatever peanut butter is crunchy in somebody's life. But if we're not in agreement about that, there's no basis for shared decision-making. And you know, when we think about it, uh, if, if we do have that level of agreement, then I have certain responsibilities that I have to carry out. Uh, one is uh, really to think of myself as a navigator or a guide uh, to a patient who's gonna be making choices. And uh, part of the responsibility of doing that is to help um, you know, the person I'm working with understand what the levels of evidence are. Uh, I have a responsibility to make it clear what are so-called proven treatments. Uh, the patient has no obligation at all to follow that advice, but I, I actually have to go through all of what there is that has been uh, accepted as effective and proven, and maybe even what the various levels are of that proof, because it's not all one thing. And then together with the patient, we will talk about um, formulating what we call a menu of reasonable choices uh, for that patient at that time. And that will include what we might know about those proven treatments, and also what we might know from the patient's experience, right? And we put that together into what is reasonable to do now. And again, um, patients are free to accept, embrace, or completely ignore any of that advice. Uh, but as we do this, we, we want to uh, recognize the duties to inform and also the freedom to choose. I, I think if somebody said to me, you know, they want to, um, they want to use omega-3 fatty acid for uh, their condition, uh, even though the proof might be scant to none, uh, one of the things that we can do is accept that as a working hypothesis because that menu of reasonable choices can then be updated if we introduce assessments and measures over time to see what's working. So I'm more than happy to let somebody do their preferred starting point um, again, presuming that we're all on the same page and that uh, the patient wants to participate in this shared decision-making, then we go through and we, we uh, offer measure-based guidance along the way and update the recommendations. And as we uh, revise that, uh, over time, we will necessarily uh, come closer and closer to what is an optimal uh, treatment plan for that patient. And we'd like to see fewer, briefer, or milder um, episodes in the, in the case of mood disorder. Yeah, the medical team that I have to treat um, my illnesses, I have more than one, um, they do in include me. Um, I build a lot of relationships based upon decision-making practices. And um, it, it serves a good purpose. You know, you, you get the discussions you need, you know, you get your, your questions answered <laughs> and, you know, they give you the option for informed decision-making. So I, I, I love that concept. And that's definitely something that I practice with the doctors that I see now. 
Um, it's helpful when you're creating a care plan or creating a plan for treatment or how to treat what's happening. Um, I feel like it's all about supporting a process. It's patient-centered care. You know, that, that, that patient has a voice. They allow you to have a voice. <laughs> and I like that. I appreciate that. One of the most important ones is making sure that the individual heard everything that we are talking about. We've all been on that side of being in the doctor's office, and we all know what it's like when we hear so much information, and yet only 20%, 50% max is what we may absorb. So one of the challenges is to make sure that the individual who I'm with at that time understands how I'm presenting it, but also, I want to hear their questions, their concerns, and that, again, gets kind of built into the risk and benefit of each of the treatments we're discussing. But I think it's really important that the person leaves with both of us having an understanding of what we discussed, and not just assume that. Well, you know, I think you start with just um, asking the clinician if that's a model they're comfortable with and trying to define what the limitations of it are. You know, it, it, it's all well and good if somebody said to me, you know, I, I have OCD and I heard that there's brain surgery for this. You know, I don't do brain surgery and you know, that, that's, I have to be able to deliver it or willing to make a referral. And the idea that uh, maybe we're recommending things quite often to, uh, to patients that aren't easily available especially now in, in the COVID era. Uh, you know, you have to be realistic about what the recommendations are and understand what the, the patient's reality is about and also their currency. The things that are appealing to me about, you know, the benefits and risks of a treatment may have entirely different meaning uh, to the, the person in the room who's gonna carry those out. Right. So, uh, you know, I have to hear and listen and understand and there also has to be an expectation on the patient side that they're gonna to have to teach me that because I don't know it instantaneously just because we're in the same room or on the same Zoom chat. You know, one of the other challenges that I see is are when um, peers or patients come in and say, I would like to be on this, or I read something about X, Y, and Z. That is helpful. I love, I love it when there's educated peers out there who know things, but not to, for clinicians out there, not to be afraid or taken aback by saying, you know what, I don't know that much about it, but you know, let me do my homework on this piece too. But also when they're coming in with information like that, you want to make sure that they are getting that information from reliable sources because there's a lot of information out there and we want to make sure that they're getting the correct information. In my early years um, of being diagnosed, it was hard for me to bring up treatment plans and treatment options. For one, I was not, you know, I wasn't educated enough. I wasn't sure of my own self. I wasn't sure of my own symptoms. I wasn't sure of what questions to ask, you know. But as I've gotten, as I've gotten older, I've learned to educate myself, like they were saying, you know, learning and, and educating myself, researching the treatments and the options that's available. So for me now. I research <laughs> and I ask questions, but beforehand I was young, you know, I didn't, wasn't as educated and wasn't as informed as I am now. My advice is to ask the questions that you're afraid to ask. You never know what kind of help you can get. You never know what the answer may be. Just ask it. I know it's scary. I know it's, it's, it feels awful. You know, you're asking for information or you're asking for help. Some people have a hard time with that. So I just think just finding that courage and, and asking. <laughs> And inquiring. Yeah, you know, I, I think just asking the question of, you know, what are the uh, treatment options that you're thinking about for me? And have you considered X, Y, or Z? If you've heard about a treatment option, maybe your clinician uh, is, is open to that, but at least asking to have the discussion, it opens the door. But we also have to, you know, another reality, unfortunately, in the clinical landscape is that uh, visits tend to be short. Right. And right. so if you're coming in and you have a 20 to 30 minute appointment, uh, it's a real good idea to say at the beginning, 
that you want to have that kind of open-ended discussion rather than at minute 28, because it's not going to be very easy to, to do it at that point. Many people who are depressed, they may have a difficult time making decisions to begin with. And so throwing a lot of information out, as Gary mentioned, in a short period of time can be pretty overwhelming. And so I always ask them at the end, remember, if you have any questions you think about even afterwards, write them down, bring them in. Um, and I think that just helps them, it helps the cohesion and the continuity of this, as well as having some discussion what the expectations are from the treatment or the plan that we're moving forward with. So um, DNS therapy was FDA approved in 2005 for the treatment of treatment resistant depression. This is depression where individuals have failed four or more treatments in the course of their illness. Um, and, um, so it also, by the way, includes both unipolar as well as bipolar depression, as the studies included. So what VNS actually is, it's, I look at it as an adjunctive treatment because many people may still be on their medications, but this is a very unique treatment that is a pacemaker-like device that is inserted just under the collarbone in an outpatient surgical procedure that takes, you know, maybe an hour, hour and a half. And then that is connected to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve then gets stimulated um, continually and pretty much it may go off so many minutes with program. And what happens is the, the um, vagus nerve receives the stimulation and those stimulations work on specific areas of the brain that we believe are involved in the pathophysiology of depression. We know that it increases blood flow in certain areas of the brain. We know it acts on some of the neurotransmitters that are involved and in, believed to be involved in the pathophysiology of depression, things like serotonin, GABA, norepinephrine. And also there's evidence to show that there's a plasticity that the brain adapts over time and, and the, there's a sustainability that occurs. So that's sort of what the basic features are of VNS. It's a one-time implant, um, other than people may need to get their generator replaced with a battery um, every 10 years or so, but it's a rather innocuous treatment. It sounds like it's invasive, but the more I am in practice and the more I see people coming in with um, similar devices, like the sleep apnea devices that they have their but on the right side using this sort of different nerves are becoming much more commonplace. We now are doing what's called the RECOVER study. This is a um, new research study that will gather more information about VNS therapy and treatment resistant depressed individuals. Um, it, will it will give the individuals the, the opportunity if they meet the criteria to have the implant put in and most of the work with the NS, by the way, is all the upfront work. It's you know getting the implant in, getting the device turned on, and from there, you know, it's pretty easy. But this is a study that's going to be looking at outcomes over a long period of time. Um, the individuals can certainly still stay with their psychiatrist because this is a um, it's a multi-centric study going around throughout the country, and the criteria are pretty basic in terms of just 18 years and older. Um, the person has to be suffering from a major depression. At the time, they have to have failed at least four treatments for their current episode. And again, it could be both unipolar and bipolar depressed patients. But it's a, I think it's a really good opportunity for individuals to learn more about it and a venue to be able to actually get the treatment if they meet the criteria. For me, I know the most common question is, what are the long-term side effects of VNS? So actually, uh, I had a, that's a great question. And I think, you know, before I get into the, the side effect profile, I usually want to present why I may have chosen this treatment and what, sort, what the expectations are. Um, I don't want to overpromise things, but basically I explained the data it's been shown that it, it, it is a very effective treatment. The treatment actually improves over time. The effects of the treatment can improve over time on the depressive symptoms. 
Uh, the data shows that there can be an improvement of both the quality of life as well as the symptoms of depression, and that it's a sustained treatment because it's really meant to be a long-term treatment. So I go through that. I want to make sure that they have a good understanding of the benefits of it. And then I go into the side effects. The short-term side effects, the more common ones are certainly maybe some post-incision pain where the, where, the, uh, where the coil was placed on the vagus nerve or where the generator was placed. That's a short-term one. When the device first gets turned on, every time the device goes off, some people experience voice alterations. So they may be, you know, hip, sitting there talking for a little bit, and all of a sudden their voice gets a little raspy, and then it gets better. Um, a lot of people, and, and by the way, that does tend to get better over time. Mm -hmm. um, another one may be the sensation of feeling like you have to cough. Again, that's something that tends to go away over time. So over time, I would say for the long-term risk, the long-term side effects are basically things that may have occurred early on, and may have just kind of sustained themselves. But truly in my experience, I've followed patients for over 20 years now, and I never had anyone actually stop the treatment because of side effects they were having. And I just had one more question. I was just wanted to know, um, like what are the proven cases of how people felt after receiving the therapy? So that's, that's a good question also, uh, that, you know, that's quite variable. I look at VMS as maybe not something to have the expectation that someone is going to get better immediately because often based on the data, it may take six, eight, 12 weeks, but that's at the benefit of if it does start working, that benefit sustains itself and patients actually continue to improve over time. And there's great data, five-year data that shows that. Okay. Um, the the um, other very important part of this is just to remind the individual that they may actually have some early improvement. I just walked away from seeing a person this morning who came in, he had his device turned down for two weeks and said, I feel almost 100% better. Um, he described a voice alteration. He goes, I can live with that for the time being. Um, but, and it's again, early in the treatment. So I think we have to allow some variability but I always try to bring it back to the data, what we know about the data, and yet it's in, it can be quite individual from person to person. Additionally, we could change medication if we needed to. We could reduce medications, which is one of the benefits of VMS. If we are fine that it's not working, we may add something different. So I also think this is not the end of the line. This is not the, the last treatment choice. Um, and for many patients, or for most patients, it isn't. Because I don't want people to walk away saying, oh, so there's no plan B, C, or D. I keep reminding them that that plan B, C, or D, with or without VNS, is still part of the picture. One of the things that we do now is, you know, there are a lot of standard antidepressant medications out there, but the chances that you will respond to the next one, if you have not responded to two or three of them, then you get the four and you five, and suddenly I am burning a lot of somebody's adult lifetime. Uh, you could probably spend a decade or more trying the next one and the next one and the next one without actually doing somebody any good. You know, when you get to your mid thirties, you don't get your twenties back because you find the right treatment finally. And that, that's one of the hardest things for me as a clinician I, I actually do fine accepting the limitations of, of what we can't do for patients because we're doing the best we can. But what I don't like is to find after years and years and even decades of, of trying, oh, we could have tried this because it was on the menu of reasonable choices 13 years ago. Why didn't we try it? And I, I think that hesitancy because something is new is something that costs patients years of quality of life uh, that we, we need to be sensitive to and put it into that contact context. Is Ayana raising her kids? Is she holding down her job? Is that a potential loss for her? And then the, the risk benefit ratio can be evaluated in that context. That is my uh, story. The efforts to find the right medicine, the right combination of medications to have a functioning life, to be able to go to work, deal with kids, deal with life. That's the story of my life. 
Um, and I think a lot of peers would agree that, yeah, the decades and years and time of trying all these different meds and you get nothing, you know, like I think uh, he mentioned the resistance, the medication resistance to treating depression is it's real. It's definitely real for me. Ayana did a great job describing is I think it's important for people to realize that if you take someone who has failed, who's depressed and has failed for treatment, they only have about a 13% chance of getting a complete recovery. So yeah. that is, you know, when I hear Ayana talk about this, I try to be very sensitive to that. And what Gary talks about losing more time. Um, a lot of patients will come in and say, boy, another treatment. Um, and I, I often have to ask, are you afraid of failing again? It's not just it's losing the time, but patients often look at it as it's, they failed at something. And so this is where I think GNS starts to come in and play a role because despite the fact that there may be only a 13% chance of complete recovery after these four treatments, we know that seven out of 10 people show significant improvement with VNS. It's a different form of therapy than what we know the antidepressants alone do.